talked about the subversive nature of Mozart's forms, the intrusions, the disruptions, the detours as being the normal way of his proceeding. And we're going to continue that with a very different piece. It's still a quintet, but it's in D major, and it's kind of a comedy, at least the first movement is. Um, and it does still have, as its primary method of operating, editable little structures, all kinds of small ideas that fit together in extraordinary ways, which then are expanded and made into big, beautiful, seamless, lyrical ideas. In fact, the, the flow is more amazing because of how hard it is to keep all of these diverse ideas flowing, all the interruptions. I think it really is re related to the fact that Mozart um, traveled a lot. And that's an understatement. Somebody figured this out that he lived 35 years plus a little, and he traveled for 10 years plus a few months of that. That's really a lot, especially since the travel was difficult, you know, carriages uh, being pulled by horses, all kinds of accidents happening all the time. And I really think that f the idea that you do get somewhere and you accept as a natural part of traveling the crazy weather, the broken wheels, the tired horses, all of this is normal. It, it must have some impact on somebody's thinking about rhythm and flow and getting from one place to the next, which is what a piece does. It starts in one key, moves to some other keys, and comes back home eventually to Salzburg or wherever it started. Um, with that in mind, I'm going to do um, some of the same kinds of little tricks we did last time, which, uh, but this time, I'm going to ask you to see or hear if you can figure out when it's right and when it's wrong. You, you don't have to tell anybody, just yourself. <laughs> that's my favorite kind of test. I think that's the way they should be. You know, you know if you're right or wrong, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> don't you like that? Oh, yes, a teacher, of course. <laughs> Aren't we all? So let's begin with the Larghetto which is how this movement opens. Those of you, with, some of you have scores, or that's a part. Aha. Uh -huh. You're going to be playing this soon? No. no. All right. <laughs> Just as well. I mean, <laughs> that, you <laughs> that you don't have a score, I mean. OK, so we're doing the, uh, the version that I found recently. We'll stop there for now. It's a beautiful opening. <clears throat> if you know the piece or if you have a score, you know that I cut out a lot of music. But what you have there is really completely normal, and that's why it's not Mozart. It is three phrases. I'll just do this for you at the piano, and then we'll put the real music back. The three phrases that you heard was one in the key and a response. and then still in the key, but a different harmony. It starts to move away from the key, but it doesn't, it comes back. And we have a balanced statement, and then one more dangerous one. And it stays on a pedal tone on the dominant, and if you don't know what that is, it's fine. It's just this is a standard closing idea. That was actually typical to have three phrases like that, but Mozart actually has more. 
So let's hear how it, it's supposed to go, and you'll hear that it is a much bigger discourse on something. I'm not sure what, though. So you see there were three small phrases that I cut out. There were three big phrases, which are the typical length and, and size, which are the same thing, and then three short phrases that were much more dramatic and actually refer to the minor key, D minor. We're in D major, but the three little phrases bring us to minor. So the, the three phrases that were edited are, in a way, scary. They are a glimpse of something that could go wrong. They're a glimpse of the dark side, which was avoided by the cuts. Now, Actually, minor is literally the dark side of major. I mean, that's basically what it, what it means. And so, after we have, if we just look at the cello going up the scale, we get his next statement is in the minor key. See, he's answered very happily, or sweetly, I should say, sweetly in major. But then he says, but what if you run into something minor? What are you going to do? And obviously it's a little scary. We don't know. It ends on a, on a half-diminished chord. What is that, you say? <laughs> well, if you don't know, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Just forget it. No, a half-diminished <laughs> half chord is not a diminished chord. It's almost a diminished chord, obviously. And in fact, there's nothing half about it. It's an American, or English, I should say English expression, half. It's actually not half, it's two-thirds. But here's a diminished chord, the diminished seventh. This is half diminished. It is very ambiguous. It is a favorite chord of a lot of French uh, 19th century and early 20th century music. If you move a half diminished chord around the piano, I could do this for hours. <laughs> I have done this for hours, actually. Okay. Um, that, that leaves you really, it's ambiguous. The, the reason that French composers loved it so much was because of its ambiguity. Um, and then the cello comes to the dominant, which is the same for a, a D major and D minor. They share the same. But we're still in minor, which is made clear here. This chord exists in the minor key, and then... We're moving towards a brighter vision of minor. And this is where the cut went to, where the cello does a diminished seventh chord, finally. But it's a diminished seventh chord. Remember, that's the scary chord. That's all you need to know about that chord. It was Beethoven called it the scary chord. It has the most potential for, possi for most possible resolutions of any traditional harmony. So a diminished seventh chord is fraught with suspense. So he gives us this chord, but it brings us back to the key which the cello provides. So the cello says, what about this? He says, don't worry. Basically, I'll, I'll take care of you. Now, I say that because in a way, it's possible to hear, if you want to get metaphorical, possible to hear this as the cello being like Leopold Mozart, the father, and the answers being Mozart. Because 
it's instructive, it's threatening, it's wise, it's controlling, and it's kind of paternal sounding, you know. Uh, but it could be Sirostro in the magic flute. It could also just be what it probably was for Mozart was just some symbol of authority and dignity and truth, or maybe it's, it's the future, maybe it's death and uh, destiny. Who knows? It's any of those things and all of them. And the reactions, though, have a timidity and a cautiousness about them. Um, so that's our full introduction. And now let's take a look at just the beginning of what happens after. Now, like a lot of uh, Mozart, but also Haydn and Beethoven, you will find a slow, a slow and dramatic and intense introduction followed by something charming and light and graceful. But it won't only be that. So then after we hear this opening, we want to figure out how does that relate to this. There must be something. So let's, let's hear um, the special edition. <laughs> like that? You might have fallen asleep then. <laughs> I, I'm gonna, I, I think that might have had that lull of a certain kind of classical music that actually Mozart never wrote. He wrote every one of those notes. That's all Mozart. But again, I removed some things. I think you should play that one more time, and I want you to really concentrate. Don't get lulled into this kind of thing. <laughs> so listen to carefully again so that when they put back what's missing, you really get it. Here's the same thing. Okay, that's all by Mozart. Now let's hear what he wrote with the parts that were removed, put back. Okay, that, it keeps going. You see how different that is as a composer? You know, I found a website just while I was waiting to start this lecture that says if you bring them your DVDs and tell them what scenes you'd like removed, <laughs> they will remove them for you and give it back to you. And it says removes all objectionable, uh, objectionable material as you see fit. And this is, and then you could watch these movies without fear <laughs> and without worry of that, that someone will be offended or that you won't like it or that your kids might see something. Isn't that wild? <laughs> if, if, if people really understood music, it would be really scary for Mozart because what I had done to this piece would be just like that kind of censorship. Let's take out the scary parts, the sudden parts, the things that make no sense. But that's what the piece is about. This is a very good illustration, uh, this particular one, because it's so dramatic, what's going on. Now, this means we have three ideas in this, at the opening of the Allegro. And that's all we have for the whole Allegro, really. We have this idea, which actually has a second part to it. It's pretty charming. The second idea, though, is this. Etc. This is wild. And then the third idea. And then it starts again. And it's exactly the same, except that it goes to a different harmony. In other words, this part is exactly the same. And this is too, at first, 
Wow, you see? <laughs> and then it goes, it changes key. That's all it does. And then it goes on to be in that key and it explores it a little bit. So it's very simple, but the, the second idea is disruptive and crazy. Nobody else was writing music like that at this time. The closest thing would be Haydn, but Haydn didn't, he did interrupt himself, but not with um, ideas that seem not to fit in at all. So the, the criticism, that's most famous criticism of Mozart, Too Many Notes, which got famous because of a movie, uh, is kind of true, but the too many notes is really what makes it so great. It's not just notes, but it's too many ideas. He was just unstoppably um, exuberant, and there are people who therefore think he must have been manic. Uh, there, there's one letter which describes him with manic behavior, uh, and, uh, in terms of bipolar kind of thing. There's one where he jumps from chair to chair and meows like a cat and says a few other things. And if you analyze the whole thing, he is not only bipolar, but it's also um, Tourette's. <laughs> in fact, he's been, both, he's been claimed to be both. I think that if you take a, a, a free spirit who's really imaginative and put them in that place at that time, and where everyone wearing wigs, <laughs> and powdered faces everywhere, and rules about everything, and power in the hands of only a few people, and everyone else treated miserably, I would be jumping around on chairs and meowing like a cat also. <laughs> I think it was the only normal person there. <laughs> anyway, so here you have this, L you could think of it, let's hear that same thing, the way it's supposed to be, and think of it as an elegant um, group of aristocrats at a party, Mozart jumping around, and then we'll just stop. And you can see there's two personalities going on here. Let's listen to it that way. Mozart. And it makes sense, too, because the other phrase, sorry, that, that little opening phrase could be written by anybody. This one, it's obviously Mozart. Not because of the actual... Uh, choice of notes, but it's the rhythms of the extremity, the interruption, the power. Okay, now how does this relate to that opening adagio? This is subtle, but it gets more and more clear over time. After we hear, we have this uh, answer. And this, and these two notes, give us, it's just the idea of moving up with an ornament and this, it's not much, but then the cello goes into another key and that's this key. So in other words, a little scalar pattern that rises and follows, fo falls, followed by E minor, the, the chord. That's exactly what this does. So are you supposed to hear that? Uh, you're not supposed to know it but you do hear it, and that's what it is. In other words, what you're hearing is that. And it makes sense at some sub subliminal level, level, and it feels right. Analyzing it like that, I don't think that, that that's normal, even when I do it. It's, I mean, it's not how I, I don't listen like that. I don't say, ah, there's that chord has come back. I, I have to look at the score for a while and say, if I have to give a lecture, what will I say about that relationship? But in fact, it's true, nonetheless. Then, <clears throat> Yes, because, you know, when you say, the, one of my favorite questions from when I, I taught a, a classroom that met every week, uh, like, well, this is meeting every week, I mean every day, um, was did Mozart know that? that people ask the, that question all the time. And I love the question because it depends what you mean by no. It doesn't depend what you mean by did. That's clear. <laughs> but no is tricky because um, when you put something, when you, make something into an analytical observation. It's different than making it happen. It's like asking if uh, a dancer or an athlete knew that they made a gesture. Well, I don't know, but maybe they did, maybe they didn't, uh, but they did do it and it's part of the, the whole picture. And with Mozart, we do know that the, the image of him just writing all this music without correcting it is not true. You were very shocked by that. <laughs> now, uh, there are sketches, not a lot. There are sketches and he changed his mind and he wrote things over. Compared to Beethoven, hardly at all. 
And the interesting thing is, though, that with most composers throughout history, if you see sketches, you see something that doesn't work, getting better, so something changing, something being thrown out. With Mozart, all the versions are good. They just get better, but they're all fine. And the worst ones sound like other composers at their best. <laughs> so it's pretty strange. Um, I, once I was in, in Poland uh, at the Jagiellonian Library looking at manuscripts that were left there by the Nazis that no one was supposed to be looking at, although a lot of musicologists had, and they were putting them out in the sunlight and letting people touch them. So I did. <laughs> <laughs> and then I told them they're not supposed to do that. But anyway, uh, I found something I had not seen, which was a, a sketch for one of the flute quartets. It was an entire movement. And I was thinking, well, look at that, it's, it's beautiful. But then there was a, a note that it, it was no good, that didn't want to use it. And I read about it later that somebody had found it. And uh, he, the entire movement is beautiful, but he just didn't like it, so it was left on the page. Most composers would have used it for sure. So, however, yes, he did change his mind. And the th we even were wondering earlier, the thought process, did he write a beautiful phrase and then purposely interrupt it? Probably. Um, because that's what the music sounds like. He might have wrote, been writing the phrase with the intention of interrupting it, but you still have to go through that process of thinking, well, here's the answer. Like when I, when I took out that interruption, that balanced phrase, you have to have that balanced phrase in order to interrupt it. You can't um, write an interruption and then go back and finish it. I mean, you could, but you already, that's already there. It's, it's already implied in the first phrase. Okay, now let's follow along a little bit what happens next. Actually, I think what we should do is compare these two things so that we hear the two keys and the other one that goes. So let's hear uh, the first time we hear it, which is bar 30. Sorry, well, you know what? That's not what I meant to ask you to play. Bar, and you knew it and did it anyway. Pick up the bar 26. That's what I wanted to the interruption. Now let's do the next one. All that, all that changes is the chords at the end. The next one at 38. That's it. So that's a lot to go through just to change key. And the funny thing about the first one is there's this huge dramatic interruption. And it doesn't accomplish anything other than being kind of a violent interruption. In other words, an interruption usually accomplishes something, like a change of key. But this doesn't. Because it starts in D major, this little phrase. And then it starts to go to E minor. But this huge interruption brings us back to D major. So maybe, uh, if you think of it as a conversation, the suggestion of changing key was rejected violently by somebody. And then it happens again, but this time the key changes. Now, key changes are very important, and there is a joke in this piece. The movement ends with a kind of joke about what you just heard, about that interruption. Now, let's move on and hear the music. Um, let's start at 42. and. How do I describe this? You know what I'm going to ask you to do? Okay, good. <laughs> I'm trying to be sneaky. It's very difficult. That's good Mozart, except that I did cut something out. So let's hear that again. And it was right at the end. Um, one of the things that Mozart does besides interruptions that's good for listening is energy change. Because he was, you know, he was an opera composer. He wrote opera all, all the time. He was always writing opera. And his chamber music and his symphonies are like operas. And so he was really a theatrical person. He had a phenomenal feeling for that. And so he not only knew when an interruption should come in like a theater director or like a playwright even more, but he also knew when the energy needed a boost. And usually 
if a key changes, right at that moment, there's a new rhythm and a new energy. So let's put that back, take the, and, but do the, um, the other thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wasn't that a great little sudden burst of da 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 da? It was fantastic. But I took something out there too. <laughs> because if I, this is going to be so clear to you that you're going to be a Mozart expert, because you will be suspicious. Or better, when you hear a performance, you'll be listening for interruptions, changes, energy changes, and that's what makes this music amazing. This time, instead of just. Lost the entire cover. Instead of just. Um, Coming to a cadence, we got to the part where he goes. So the energy changed, and then eventually we got there. But I cut something out. What do you think? What? <laughs> the music is following me everywhere. What do you think could be cut out from there? We had a big ch key change, uh, he upped the energy. And there was still something cut out. What could possibly be cut out? Let's find out. Now this is the whole thing. <laughs> Fantastic. See, he really keeps you on the edge of your seat if you, if you are paying attention. And what we have there in this very short space of time is some counterpoint based on that idea, a change of key, a new energy with different rhythm, a sudden shift quietly into a minor key that we didn't expect, and then the cadence. That's a lot of activity. It's huge. It's the kind of thing that I'm sure would be censored by these people's, w this website I found. <laughs> because you get a glimpse of A minor. Who wants to see a glimpse of A minor? That's scary. <laughs> you know, take that out. OK. Now, we could go from beginning to there. But rather than do that, starting right at that cadence, we'll go to the end of the exposition with that one thing removed. <laughs> I have to get, you, you get the idea. But the reason I keep doing it is because no matter how many times I do it, I think, even for me, I love hearing it missing and put back because it's amazing what he does. Uh, I tried to do this with some dialogue from a play, and it was so hard because you know, you know what someone means. You can do it. You can do it. They do it all the time. In fact, one of the things that's amazing is in Shakespeare productions when people have to make cuts, you know, take a four hour play and make it two and a half hours. You can make a great play out of that. Uh, you can cut all kinds of interesting material, and it's still fantastic, because there's a similarity. All the side issues, all the subplots, all the extra characters. You could take whole people out. <laughs> Hamlet, in the version by um, Olivier, has no Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. They're not even in it. OK. <laughs> it's just bothering me all of a sudden. <laughs> All right, let's do that thing with that one with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern cut out. Okay. <laughs> That's how the so-called exp exposition ends, which it is the ending of the, all the 
I mean, the basic material, it's a huge amount. But they cut out something. That was a lot to listen to, and it was, a, it was already a lot of music there. But what was cut out, again, is a huge dramatic interruption that can just completely unexpected change of mood. Let's put it back. <laughs> Isn't that amazing, Th that passage that was taken out? That it's, again, a gigantic interruption. It's full of sforzandos, you know, suddenly loud passages. It goes into a minor key suddenly, and it's very disruptive, and it calms down in a breathless way, mm -ba -da -da, mm -ba -da, with a new rhythm, and then it goes back. So, now we get the basic idea. <clears throat> However, the exposition ends with these little question marks, these tiny notes. Da, 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 da. Where do those little notes come from? Well, it's important to know that everything uh, in Mozart is either a disruption or a continuity. That's kind of obvious, I suppose. <laughs> Don't quote me on that one. <laughs> but what I mean is even the smallest details are, uh, have a kind of continuity that is important to look at. It's not just that, uh, I mean, continuity is not only about sense, but in the details are remarkable. So for example, every little thing matters. Uh, the opening phrase, which I'm just doing faster, There are two notes here, not one. He could have gone or, or, or something, but he goes. That may seem trivial, and it is. That's what's great about it. You take a little trivial thing, if you're Mozart, and you just turn it into something enormous. This is great. Doesn't that happen every day? I mean, almost, I certainly know, maybe not in my house, but in most places you have a conversation and some little annoying thing takes over the entire conversation. <laughs> You're trying to talk about world something or other and s somebody you know, puts the salad drops on the table and that's it, you know? <laughs> and that's the rest of the conversation. Why can't you serve salad properly? <laughs> Why is there no salt? Didn't you realize we're out of olive oil? I don't know. <laughs> But I mean, a little thing like those two little notes is enormous. And uh, it's, what makes it great is that, uh, I hate to use that expression, at any rate. It actually is like life that the details become bigger and bigger and, and become the focus of a lot of activity, at the same time as it's full of interruptions and diversions. So it's completely realistic in a strange way and that music can be. So let's start write where these little question marks are and hear what he does with them. And then I'm going to show you how many choices he had at least uh, before he decided what to do. Let's start at 89 and then go through to, uh, ooh, about 107 or so. <laughs> Okay, good, yeah, okay. It's very entertaining, uh, doesn't need a lot of comments, and I use entertaining as a good word in this case. I sometimes hate it, but it's fine here. Uh, it's, it's great, and you know, we're in the stratosphere, for, especially by that time, violins going up here, and it's surprising, it's quiet, and it's great that there's tension in the quietness. That's always, you know, it's, it's very powerful. It's uh, the drama being surrounded by silence and with repeated little quiet notes is very tense and slightly humorous. 
you know. Um, but what's great is you get a diminished chord, the chord that can go anywhere, right there. Now before we go on, Mozart might have thought for seconds before he figured out what to do. Um, I say that because he <laughs> thought very quickly. Um, he had a lot of choices here. Now when I said uh, to our shocked listener about that he rewrote a lot, <laughs> remember though that he wrote so much music that the reason we often say that Mozart wrote so quickly that he couldn't have been rewriting, but he was, it's even more amazing that he was critic, self-critical in rewriting at that speed. Um, dying at 35 and writing as much music as he did is just an unprecedented phenomenon. It's, there's nothing like it in the history of almost anything, really. But uh, right here, he has many choices because the diminished seventh chord has three minor thirds. And these are two of them. I mean, this is one of them with two notes, two, one minor third. And he goes like this. But he could have done that in four different keys. He could go anywhere he wants. He could have done, instead of these two notes, what if he put these up here? And then he could have gone, it's the exact same thing. Or he could have had these two notes and then gone, you see what I'm doing here? Or he could have done this. So he had four keys doing exactly the same progression that he could have gone in. All of them would have been a little bit shocking, so you might as well just do one. But then, uh, well, some less than others, but then he doesn't stay there, that's what's great. Because he could have gone from here to into E minor. But because that's what everyone is expecting, once he does this, then he does and then there's a big silence. And it's slightly funny because he went from a tense harmony with great ambiguity, lots of little silences, to a relaxed kind of, it's a dominant seventh, we're going to go to a nice major key now with a big silence. So there's a sense that it's going to be okay. It's slightly humorous. And actually, some of you laughed right at that moment, which is good. Um, and... Now he could have skipped, he could have done this. I'm skipping something, I'm always cutting things out. Instead of doing. He could have skipped the second one. See, it's closer. He put a chord in that takes you on the wrong direction. See, every little thing he's taking, he's, it's all card tricks, which he liked. He liked acrostics, card tricks, Word games, puns, masquerade balls, uh, all of these things. There's a lot written about it. There's a lot of evidence. Riddles, he told riddles. He wrote lots of riddles out on cards and handed them out at various balls. You know, they had a lot of masked balls in his time. And his father uh, owned a Harlequin costume, which he sent to, to Wolfgang once so he could wear it at a, at a ball. And they were performing a big pantomime and he was handing out riddles. So this is, and he also wrote letters full of, of little codes. He wrote in code because he was often writing nasty things about important people. <laughs> the codes were not that complicated, <laughs> but they probably didn't need to be. So, because who would know? But, you know, people did read those letters. There was some censorship, speaking of censorship, which is kind of, what I'm doing when I take out all the good parts. So again, every little thing he does is misleading on purpose. So the dynamics too. You know, it's all misleading. Okay, so then we start to get, we are now in the development section, which is a, already humorous because the development section is supposed to be where you develop the material, but it's already very highly developed. A million things have happened to this music already, but that's fine. Um, I, I often see references in, there used to be something called liner notes, do you remember those? <laughs> now you can find them, but you have to know what you're doing on the computer. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I used to write them a long time ago. I, d I did it for Sony for years and years and years, and now I don't know, what if, they still have people doing it, don't they? I think so, but you can, sometimes you can't find them. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, people will often say that Mozart, in this case, 
um, is not following sonata form, or he's, he's not doing the strict sonata form here. There is no strict sonata form. And he never did what you would call something as a strict form, because the forms are self-evolving little dramas. It's like looking for a, a you know, the well-made play concept? Uh, there is such a thing, but really good plays are not made quite in the same way as each other. So uh, let's hear now some of this development section, and you'll see that he, for a long time, he just plays with da, 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 and he keeps changing key. So he's actually having fun. He's kind of showing off that with these little repeated notes and this idea from the beginning, that he can take that and keep changing key all the time, and it really is like a little card trick. Let's start right at the development. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. She gave something away, but I didn't ask you to stop there. Okay. Basically, uh, you know what's going to happen now. But basically, uh, that whole section, that's nobody but Mozart wrote like that. Not even Haydn, who was, you know, I say not even Haydn because, you know, Haydn wrote more like Mozart after Mozart. Because, you know, first there was Haydn, then there was Mozart and Haydn, <laughs> then there was just Haydn. That's how I think I told some of you that I, uh, I explained this once to a little piano student I had years and years ago by telling her that Haydn lived from here to here and Mozart lived from here to here. And she said, but from here to here was Haydn alive too? <laughs> <laughs> it was the best question. I had to say yes. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Haydn's music changed a lot after he was exposed to Mozart. And that's a remarkable thing, because he was a hugely famous established master who everybody revered. But he saw the genius of Mozart and reacted to it. And so there is music that sounds more like this after Mozart wrote than before. But this, what you have here is the minimal material with a huge amount of changing key. So it is kind of dizzying. And you're on the edge of your seat. It's both suspenseful and funny at the same time. That is not easy to do at all in any medium. Um, so, then, as soon as that's over, the entire rest of the development section, which is not huge, but it's substantial, is only based on the interruption idea. That interruption. So let's hear the entire development going up to um, bar 144, where the recap. So you're going to hear only these two things. It's divided in half. Part A, the little key changes with the little mice or whatever you want to call them, and then the uh, interruption. But the interruption is contrapuntal. You're almost ready to play each few seconds, I know. Uh, the interruption is contrapuntal. It overlaps in canonic writing, so there's a, there is a new fabric. So he's taken the interruption and made it almost scholarly. He's explored it. That's it. That's the entire development. Now, you get the interruptions that originally broke the fabric of the piece. That becomes the entire focus. And then at the end, you notice the yum bum bum comes back. So he brings them together, which is also 
uh, and especially as his music goes on, as he's more mature in his late years, in his 30s, uh, he always combines things. Anything that was at all worth writing down becomes uh, some kind of fabric. It gets woven into a texture. All right, and that basically is the end of the development, and now we have the return. Now, what is going to make this return interesting? He starts it exactly the same way, the same music, the same interruption, the same little cadence. Let's hear that and stop, and then we'll have to think. And your homework assignment is to write the next section. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead, let's try that. It's all the same. So, <laughs> we know that he should do that exact same thing again, but change key. But he's not going to do that, right? Because that would be terrible. There are a lot of composers who, had they managed at his, in his time to write such interesting music, would still, at this point, just write the same music and try to keep it all in the tonic key like that. But what happens? It turns out that the cello at the beginning was right. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, why don't you start again at the, at the beginning of the recap so we can tell what happens. This is the same again. It's minor. It's changing key all the time. Okay, great, 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 right. So basically, the second part that's supposed to balance out the first part does go into a minor key and does start changing keys, so that warning, whether it was Leopold or Sarastro or whoever it was at the beginning, comes true. That minor key appears, and it doesn't last long, but were we prepared? Who knows? Now that means that that big interruption never got to be heard again. Do you want to hear it again? Well, probably you do, subliminally, and you want the balance, you want the symmetry. Symmetry is very important. This piece goes on for quite some time, and you don't get to hear it again until the very, 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 very end. <coughs> and it's kind of hilarious what happens. Um, I, we don't need to go through every little thing now, because we will hear the whole piece, uh, I mean the whole movement, and a little more. But let's go to right before the return of the L <laughs> of the Larghetto. <laughs> I'm giving this away. If you know the piece, great. Basically, something happens that Mozart had never done and nobody had done at the time, and basically what happens is the piece is moving along and it comes to a stop right before the end, and the opening returns, that big slow opening with the cello. It's, uh, what is that doing there? Talk about interruptions and strange structures. Uh, it comes in the both wrong and right place. In other words, if you're going to start the piece over, this would be the moment. But are you really going to start this whole thing over? So let's go back to uh, 200 and go to the Larghetto. Now what they're going to do is go uh, towards the second part of the exposition. And remember that section with the big violent interruption with the big chords that I put back? That's going to be even bigger this time. That's, he makes it six measures instead of four. Okay, 200. Closing theme. So this should be the end. Oh no, this is going to happen again? So what's going to happen? Well, what's ha what he does is probably the least expected thing. The piece is starting over. Did somebody hit rewind? 
It's exactly the same. Oh, this is different. And now everything's different. Now, what's going to happen? The piece seems to have started over. Well, the one phrase that we missed is the same phrase that starts the Allegro. It was taken out in the middle later, so we get it back. And guess what? That's it. That's it. He ends it like that. It really is strange, isn't it? It's meant to be strange. It is funny. It's comical, even though it has this big dramatic um, a, a larghetto before this happens. The structure is hilarious. Um, it's full of, of comic brilliance. And what's great about that is, remember the first time that interruption comes in, what's, it stays in the key of D major. It doesn't move. So when it does it this time, he thought, okay, I'm done. It's in D major. So he took the strangeness of the first one, the fact that it was an interruption, but it doesn't actually change the key, and made it both balance the missing symmetry and make a joke out of the fact that this huge interruption actually doesn't go anywhere, it stays home. So it might as well be over. It's really brilliant stuff. Now, before we hear the whole movement, Let's listen to some of the second movement. And what I'm going to ask them to do is play the first 15 bars, and then I'm going to ask you to think for a moment about what Mozart would do next. If, well, what would he do? Let's hear the first 15 bars. Yes, now that's, that's the first 15 bars. You don't have to answer out loud, but just think. Let's say the idea was to come up with something that Mozart would do. Just think to yourself what it is. Now, I'm going to ask them to back up even just a vague concept. Obviously, you don't have to write the music, but what's the concept? Now, let's back up to, let's say, uh, oh, bar 11 with a pickup. So we're backing up a little bit to where we just were, and then they're going to play the next little section.
then it kind of starts to go back to the other kinds. So hopefully you thought something extremely different, something very dramatic. It didn't need to be funny here. This is not a funny movement. But it, it is very, again, disruptive, but it's very romantic what he does and very uh, intensely lyrical and kind of structurally dissonant. And by structurally dissonant, I mean there are many kinds of dissonance. There's local dissonance, like two notes. You know, if you do um, this note is dissonant to this one. There are harmonic dissonances, like this. That chord is dissonant because it needs to resolve to here. That's two levels of dissonance. And then there's structural dissonance, where a section is in dissonant, not moment to moment, but to the things around it. That's what this is, and that's very important. And Mozart was a huge um, pioneer of that. And if I were to say a composer who learned how to do that and got it, made it bigger and bigger from Mozart, it would be Schubert. In Schubert, you probably played some of the quartets, some of you. In the Schubert, um, well, any of the pieces, but Death and the Maiden, or the G major quartet, the structural dissonances are huge, and they are a lot like what just happened here. So, let's go here. We, I think we have time. Yes, yes, almost exactly what we need to do. We can hear the entire first movement. Let's see, do we have time for a repeat? Mm, I don't think so. I think we better plow through. Uh, it's huge. You know, Mozart really expanded the forms uh, of not just chamber music, but <coughs> all the musical forms. They got so much bigger than they had been before. And even though Haydn was getting there, Mozart made these giant statements, partly because he always could continue what he was doing by having something new come in, which would then be incorporated into the structure, and then something new again, and all of it would then be put together. Other people were trying to, especially the, the, um, the model that Haydn started with, was really, and Beethoven followed it later, to limit yourself as few ideas as you possibly can, to limit yourself and explore them fully until they're exhausted. But with Mozart, he did that and kept throwing new things in all the time. Okay? All right.
You feel better, don't you? <laughs> I just wanted to point out, because I didn't say it before, that there, we know that there were performances of this piece and of the quintet from last week, the G minor, in which the two violists were Mozart and Haydn, which is kind of remarkable. It must have been very good. All right, thank you. See you at, for Beethoven next time. <laughs>